Restaurants and Reservations The Paradox of Prejudice I'd like to start by saying this was not an easy rant for me to make because I had to go into some dark parts of who we are and things we like to bury under the candy-coated toppings of history. I apologize in advance to those who prefer happy endings. I'm not trying to be all Captain Bringdown or harsh on your mellow. Fair warning, this might offend. Anyone who has followed my work over the last five years knows that I don't like picking on people, especially demographic groups. As the movie saying goes, there are only two things I can't stand in this world. People who are intolerant of other people's cultures and the Dutch. I'm easy. All God's children, I'm not judging. Except that's not true. I hate the Eskimos. You see, my father died in the Bering Sea when his whaling boat was rammed by a giant Eskimo canoe. My sister died in the Yukon Territory when her Eskimo guide had built a faulty igloo and it collapsed on top of her. My brother died in a bizarre sled dog accident. He had purchased the dogs from, as you can imagine, the Eskimos. None of that was true. I don't even have a brother, but you get my point. It's an easy trap to fall into. Something bad happens to you and your first instinct is to put the blame on an individual or group. In this case, those ice cube munching Eskimos. While writing this, I learned that truly I hate no particular demographic. But some still really annoy me. Homeless people, for example. Does strongly disliking the homeless make me unsympathetic? to the financially and hygiene challenged. Not really. I just don't like smelly people who urinate in the streets while asking me for money. But there it is. A bias. A prejudice. A discrimination. And as you can see, it had nothing to do with race. There is an old philosophical debate on what is the most common human trait. Laziness or fear? You can debate those all you want, but the third one has got to be prejudice, or whatever word you want to call it. We all do it. We all discriminate against others. We create bias and prejudice. And even though we don't want to, often we do judge a book by its cover. In today's world, everything is compartmentalized into a number of different isms. Sexism, racism, classism, ageism, isms based on sexual preference or religion, even weight. Picking on the fat kid at the playground just carried over when we got older. Now it's called body shaming. All these things have developed and evolved over thousands of years. It starts when we're young and just snowballs slowly over time until we're older and then everything turns to concrete. Want a crash course in young prejudice? Take a look at the 1985 movie, The Breakfast Club. Five kids representing five different groups. The jocks, the nerds, the burnouts, the rich, and the outcasts. Still relevant today, and two things to keep in mind. The first is that they left out all the controversial demographics. No people of color, no gay people, no religious right, just to name a few. The second is that the happy bonding ending was too much of a stretch. In real life, they would have just given each other the middle finger and then gone back to their comfortable cliques, never to speak again. Some of us want to be individuals, but most of us want to fit in, to be part of the crowd, to join the majority. That's a fun word, isn't it? The majority? It is, of course, completely relative, and fluid, and potentially dangerous. There is an old saying that conformity builds empires. We are encouraged to conform, to build majorities. Governments want you to become a cohesive unit, to bond. They then use that bond in the form of nationalism. 
the most dangerous of isms, to create enemies around you. This land is your land, this land is my land. No, wait, stop. That's just a song lyric. The truth is that this land is our land, and that land, well, it may be something we want, and we just might take it from you. Not because you look different or speak a different language, but because you are flying a different flag. The ultimate discrimination is war. We turn you into an enemy, and we tell our people that we are right and you are wrong. We hate you. It's required for, you know, the whole killing thing. Our history is filled with so many different and sometimes repeated wars, it's amazing we have gotten this far. For time's sake, I'm not going to go into all the killing fields of Europe and Asia. It was America that honed the edge of hate. We killed the British, twice, then we killed the Mexicans, then each other, then some Spanish, which are not to be confused with Mexico, Spain is after all an entirely different place. After that, we killed some Germans in trenches, then went back and killed a whole bunch more Germans, the Nazi version, while at the same time killing Japanese on the other side of the world. Then we started killing Koreans, and stayed over there killing people in Vietnam, some from Cambodia, Laos. It's a little fuzzy, and I wasn't there, man. And for the last 20 years, we've been in the Middle East, taking out various Islamic people. And that's just the groups the U.S. killed wholesale. While all that was going on, the U.S. thought it was a good idea to have different companies go straight into Africa and just start taking prisoners. No war, we just took them, transported them to the Caribbean for slave conditioning, and then finally relocated them to the States. If you're curious, the U.S. initially purchased about 300,000 Africans. Now they make up 13% of the population, roughly 40 million people. The U.S. didn't invent slavery, not even close. The Greeks did it, so did the Romans and the Egyptians. People act like the U.S. was the last country to even have slaves. Officially, the last country to officially abolish slavery did so in 1981. Note I said officially. In other parts of the world, it never ended. The big difference is that other countries use their own people. India currently has the highest number of slaves in the world at over 18 million. It's considered modern slavery, but the terms are familiar. Forced child labor, forced marriage, commercial sexual exploitation, bonded labor, forced recruitment into non-state armed groups, that's drafting slaves into your own private army. All this is far more advanced than working a tobacco field in Virginia, but the premise is still the same. And how do you count human trafficking? Isn't that just a longer word for slavery? Money changes hands, services rendered. I don't know, we keep changing terms. But in 2020, apparently there are still 167 countries that deal in human trafficking. The governments decide the groups who are in the minority, which again is relative. This reminds me that being the minority depends on where you are. If I moved to Mexico City, I would be a minority at the mercy of the Mexican people. If I moved to Greece, I would be in the minority compared to, say, Spartans. And if I landed on Themyscira, I would no doubt be a second-class citizen. That last place was where Wonder Woman was born. Pretty sure it's not real. The Chinese were considered second-class citizens when they helped build the U.S. railroad system. The same thing happened with the Irish, and there were millions of them. While that was going on, we were creating a massive contradiction with the Native Americans. First, we named them Indians because we thought we had landed in India. It was wrong, but it stuck. We fought them as we expanded across the country. Then just before we went full genocide, we decided to create reservations of land, relocate all the tribes, and send them money every month until forever. 
We've used their images and icons for hundreds of years. Indian head pennies, nickels, gold pieces. Popular cars like the Jeep Cherokee. In sports as the Braves, the Redskins, the Seminoles. And of course, most military helicopters. Like the Blackhawk, Chinook, Apache, Comanche, and so on. We revere them as past warriors, but most people look away when the topic is raised. How can you be proud and ashamed at the same time? It's tricky. They now live in towns that are exempt from just about every federal tax and a whole bunch of laws. Eventually, they figured out they could build gambling houses and there was nothing we could do about it. So if you ever hear me use the term Casino American, know that it is out of admiration. They found a loophole in the system. Well played. The Japanese were perfectly fine living in the US until World War II started. Then we rounded them up and put them into internment camps until you know that whole atomic bomb thing. I know, sometimes the US is the worst. But hey, at least we never fought Russia, right? Technically, no. However, they were quickly transformed into our nemesis. We're funny that way. Remember better dead than red? Our marketing people came up with that catchy little slogan against communism. No one has a problem with communism, right? See what I'm doing? Sooner or later, I will find something that you will crinkle your nose and squint your eyes at. What about me? I'm a white American male. Sounds pretty solid, right? Not if you're a millennial who has beef with a boomer. Ha, got you there. I'm Gen X, and currently nobody hates us. Maybe Gen Z will down the road. Too early to tell. What if I was a minority within a minority? How far can we take that? What if I was a black, lesbian, Republican, vegan, atheist who is also handy capable? I'm not sure I can say handicapped in 2020. Better safe than sorry. Even if you do everything right and don't hate or fight anyone, you still run the risk of persecution. Think I'm kidding? Try pacifism. Meaning when someone attacks you, you don't fight back because you won't resort to violence. Seems more than reasonable and safe. Unless you're Jewish and living in Germany during the 1930s. We won't go into all the details, but things went badly. So badly, in fact, that at one point the Germans were posting only four guards per 1,000 prisoners at the concentration camps because, well, they never resisted. If you are one of those who say that the Holocaust didn't happen, at the very least you have to admit that Hogan's Heroes was a completely different camp. If you ever wondered why the Jewish people had their own living accommodations, it was because of pacifism. Seems like a paradox, but it happens. If you fight back, you get concessions. From what I can tell, just about every country that fought America got to eventually open their own restaurants across the country, and then pretty much forgot the war ever happened. I'm completely serious. Spanish cuisine, sushi everywhere, Korean barbecue, Chinese buffets, they were part of the Korean War. Vietnamese places, tons of Mexican restaurants. You find your silver linings where you can. You lose the war, you get restaurants. The Jewish people ended up getting their country back in 1947 and implemented mandatory military service, so that helps, I guess. They still have some issues to work out there with the West Bank. What is the point of all this? Maybe that awareness comes in small steps and every little bit helps, but don't think for a second that we will be able to create a mass paradigm change on our own. It's just not who we are, and you know it. Tearing down statues and facing monuments of the politicians that helped build this country won't do much because most of the message falls on deaf ears. You want to see rage? Watch some of the highlights from the Rodney King riots, where they burned LA during the middle of the day. And that was almost 30 years ago. 
We are a world of many different cultures and belief systems. We are the true example of art through adversity. If you believe in God, then eventually you must accept that all human variations were put here for a reason, even if some don't appeal to you. What's the alternative? That people all look and talk the same and everyone just stands around staring at each other smiling? That would just freak me the hell out. Worry not. When you get up tomorrow, all the bias will still exist. My peace-loving God is still better than your peace-loving God, and I will cut anyone in half who says otherwise. There will always be someone that lives on the other side of the tracks. And Packers fans will always hate Bears fans because they are supposed to. Treat others better than you treat yourself. I'd like to believe that was completely possible. At the very least, it's something to strive for. A more realistic approach was something that Ronald Reagan said during his last UN speech. That maybe all of our differences would be put aside if we were faced with a threat from outside this world. Something that could unify us all. It's a nice idea, until you think about it a little further. Once all the groups unified against the common threat, we would all become the majority, and our discrimination and hate would be shifted to the spaceships filled with little green men. I'm just kidding. They're not green. I'll end with a quote from John Lennon. A person should not believe in isms. He should believe in himself. Think about that the next time you want to make life harder for someone that is different from you. Then again, Lenin was a British, Marxist, stoner, hippie, musician, pacifist. What the hell does he know? Screw John Lennon. <laughs> <laughs>